Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 216 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing Stranger Things, a Netflix original series about a young boy who mysteriously vanishes from a small Indiana town. The show was set in 1983 and is an homage to classic works of that era by writers such as Stephen King and directors such as Steven Spielberg and John Carpenter. And we're talking about this show today because we got a request from listener Paige Kleckner, so thank you Paige for the idea. And this will involve spoilers for the first eight episodes, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up we've got Andrew Liptak, who you may remember from our panel on The Expanse back in episode 180, and our panel on The Magicians back in episode 199. He's the weekend editor at The Verge, and he also co-edited the anthology War Stories, New Military Science Fiction. His writing has appeared in io9, Clark's World, Kirkus, and Lightspeed. So Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Then next up, we've got Carly Veloci. She's the weekend editor at Gizmodo and the creator of Postmortem Magazine. Her writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, Broadly, and Polygon, and you should all go check out her recent io9 article, Stranger Things is a Nerdy Story That is So Much More Than Its References. So, Carly, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And also joining us today is Peter Rubin. He's a senior editor at Wired, where he oversees pop culture and entertainment coverage. He's currently hard at work on a book about virtual reality, which will be published by Harper One in 2018. And you should all go check out the recent Wired.com article, OK, Let's Talk About That Stranger Things season finale, which he wrote with Brian Raftery. So, Peter, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. You've got quite a dossier worked up on me, huh? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, this is like hardcore geeks podcast here. Let's get into it. (laughs) Okay, yeah, and so the first thing I want to say about this show, as I mentioned in the intro, is that it's sort of an homage or a pastiche of all these different 80s movies. And I'm just wondering what you guys thought about that aspect of it. So let's start off with Andrew. Uh, Did that aspect of the show work for you? Uh, totally. Um, while I, I was watching it, I, I kept getting reminded of uh, two of my favorite films, which is um, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and uh, E.T., The Extraterrestrial. And that it's obvious that the, the Duffer brothers really drew from those two films and sort of made, as I've been describing it to friends, it's basically an eight hour version of a Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah. How about Carly? Did you like all the, the references? I did. I mean, I was born in 1990, so I kind of missed the 80s, but it was something that I, like, I watched a lot of, like, these kinds of movies growing up, and I read a lot of Stephen King, so it was a very, it was a very nice thing to kind of be reminded of as I watched it. Right, well, it's it's interesting, because you would think from watching this that the Duffer Brothers were kids in 83, and that they were, like, really attached to that time period, but they were actually born, I think, in 84, so uh, I guess they just absorbed it through going back and watching all these older movies, but it does really capture that. I think 80s nostalgia is, yeah, I think 80s nostalgia is kind of just something that permeates our culture even now, so it's pretty easy to still experience that. Yeah, yeah. They were talking in an interview recently about how they were, uh, you know, they came of age in the 90s, and they they were more of, uh, like, Magic the Gathering fans than they were of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, but when they decided to set the film, or sorry, to set the series in in the 1980s, they realized they had to, to... sort of go back and, and sort of capitalize on some of the stuff that happened then rather than in the 90s. Um, so rather than having Magic the Gathering in, in the show, they had Dungeons and Dragons, which was more popular at that time because uh, uh, Magic the Gathering had, didn't even exist hmm. yet. Well, I thought the show did a, a better than usual job of depicting Dungeons and Dragons accurately. I mean, most movies, when you play Dungeons and Dragons, you go crazy and like try to kill people. So it's a pretty low <laughs> bar. But uh... True. Yeah, I was like, I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons now with like a group of friends. So it was funny to see them playing it versus how we play it. And I was like, they're not taking turns. <laughs> also, there's no beer. And I think as grown ups, if we've gotten <laughs> back into into pen and pe- pencil uh, or pencil and paper RPGs, there's there's generally some intoxicants involved. <laughs> yes, but there was pizza. <laughs> it's true. It's a universal. Mm-hmm. I mean, my big plausibility issue with this whole show is that they killed the Thessal Hydra with just one fireball. I mean, come on. <laughs> exactly. I had the same reaction. <laughs> I will say that my uh, my they had a lot more polish than my Dungeons and Dragons experiences had. Mine were kind of spending hours 
drawing these ridiculous maps using graph paper and then when it actually came down to playing it would just devolve into a complete mess so the fact that they showed any kind of tactical awareness went far beyond any D D prowess that that i or my friends ever had when we were that age <laughs> i mean the other thing is that you know at the time in 83 dungeons and dragons was embroiled in this huge controversy and oh, there yeah, was that... no allusion to that in the show and certainly i remember people adults being a lot more uh suspicious of dungeons and dragons than the adults in this seem to be oh for sure that kind of dovetailed with the the satanic panic of the 80s i mean this was you know in 1983 I was living in Indiana. Like, that's where I grew up. This was, there was so much about this that, that was my childhood, except for the, the pedal generated headlamps on the bikes. Everything was pretty much exactly <laughs> as it really was. There were weird back roads and there were quarries and there was D and D and there was mystery. Um, and you could just kind of go out and roam around with your friends. It was that it really does a nice job, I think, of recapturing, at least for, for the dinosaurs among us, <laughs> what, what kind of what it was like then. Yeah, well, so so Peter, I, so I read the the piece on Wired.com I mentioned, and it sounds like you were a little less taken with all the '80s references than than other well, people, maybe. I, I was I was taken with them, but at a certain point, and this was maybe about forty percent of the way through the show, it began like I, I hit a rut. Um, it was kind of a there was this sine wave thing that happened where. The first few episodes, my wife and I were just completely enraptured and it was, oh, what about this? And what about that? And oh my God, that little girl is dressed exactly like Gertie was in E.T. And then after a certain point, I was like, well, I would also like this to stand on its own. Let's see if it's going to stand on its own. So I, I, there was some, there was a little bit of pastiche fatigue, which is really uh, an unfortunate pairing of words, but it it began to set in. And then it they righted the ship. I think it ended up being... Um, standing, you know, being a standalone story that was kind of compelling in its own right, even while it was kind of inexorably rooted in and influenced by the the kind of other texts that we've been talking about. Yeah, I guess the the homages and things weren't as much of an issue for me because I was not like I, I mean I I like Stephen King and Steven Spielberg and John Carpenter, but they weren't like the center of my geekdom growing mm -hmm. up, as it were. So I mean, I saw ET as a kid, but I, I you know I couldn't tell you. Gertie was wearing that dress or, or things like that. I mean, but certainly I did I did get a strong ET vibe from the whole thing. Oh yeah. And um and yeah, so I, I did I I mean I, I really loved it. I really enjoyed it, but there there was a little bit of a, as you're saying this sort of overly familiar quality to it. Um I don't know like Andrew, did you how did you feel about that? Do you was there anything about it that you you thought was too much with the references? Um, I think that the the main thing for me was that it it replicated the the feel of a 1980s movie right down to the fact that it was a boys' adventure and it was a it was it only focused on that all the the girls in the in the in the series and all the women were basically relegated off to the side um, and there, there's been a little bit of commentary about this but like uh, like Barb for example was sort of just a side character that was just sort of summarily killed off um, there's no girls in the the grouping of 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 the four boys. Um, and then when, when 11 shows up, there's some certain things that sort of take place that, um, I know made some people sort of unhappy with how it was portrayed. Um, and that's, that sort of falls in line with a lot of the eighties movies. Like ET is, is sort of the same way. Uh, close encounters is sort of the same way there, it's there. It's not as basically, basically while, while it was looking back at the 1980s, it didn't think to really examine, what those films really did and, and sort of reinterpret it in a new in a more modern sensibility. Well, right. I saw, Andrew, you linked to an article by our friend Genevieve Valentine on Fox that I thought yes. was really good. Um, and yeah, and she was pointing out that uh, when Will goes missing, it's like a huge catastrophe for the whole town and becomes the center of the whole story. And when Barb goes missing, like Nancy's the only person who even seems to notice. Yeah. And it was it was like pointedly that because she, she goes and, and questions people like, you know, have you seen her? And, and they sort of assume that she runs away. Now, that part part of that is that it, there was a bit more of a cover up. Her car was moved by the, the federal agents and, and it was sort of they were sort of directed to make it look like that. But as uh, as an audience member, you know that that's not the case. Uh, and and Guinevere's article, I thought, was spot on. It, it really it really captured all all of those you know smaller problems. Um, not to say that it wasn't that there was it was handled badly. It was just it was just unexamined. Yeah, it didn't improve on the things that the, the inspirations, right? Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, Carly, what do you think about the the female characters in this show? Well, I mean, I think a- Andrew um, has touched upon something when, like, they just kind of ignore Barb after a while, which is kind of sad. Because, like, um, Nancy, you know, calls the mom, or I forget if she calls the mom or the mom calls her, but, and then that's the last we see of the mom. So you would think that, like, the mom would be having her own story off to the side somewhere because her daughter's missing, but that does, that's not the case. Although, I mean, and there's definitely some weight to the fact that, you know, they're, the female characters could have been portrayed better, but I think that there are so many side stories going on, and while the main story is the story of these four boys in Eleven, I think there's, you know, some interesting stuff going on with Nancy and with... um Joyce that are that kind of elevate those characters up a bit more um and I'm not sure if this is because the performances are so good or if the writing's really good but you know just seeing um Joyce deal with you know her her son missing and it kind of starts off kind of tropey where the town is like oh you know she's kind of going a little nuts but I think that, like, that's kind of ignored after a little while, and then we see Joyce just being like, you know what, screw this, I'm gonna go find my kid, as crazy as this whole situation is, and she becomes a very interesting, powerful character in that way, and then with Nancy, there's this whole, like, side story that's kind of a 80s rom-com thing, and I think that's where the, the Duffer Brothers and whoever else was writing on it really kind of took advantage of these kind of like outdated tropes and cliches because then you have like you know nancy kind of teaming up with jonathan but it's not really a romantic thing it's definitely a i'm gonna go find my brother and my friend kind of thing and then you have steve who becomes basically this entire like counter to like 80s like jock boys um so there's some, like, little things that go on in the show that make it more interesting in that regard. Um, but I definitely can see how, you know, especially with Barb, that it, it's, like, there's definitely some, like, haphazard, we're going to forget about this story for a while. That's kind of disappointing. I will say that Winona Ryder was fantastic in this. She, she really, her character was fin- fantastic. Yeah, and I think Winona Ryder plays Frazzled really, really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I love Winona Ryder, and I think that she's done some incredible work in the past even year. I thought she was uh, fantastic in that HBO miniseries Show Me a Hero last year. But I thought that she she skewed a little kind of unrelentingly frazzled. Like, there there wasn't a ton of nuance in this. And I wouldn't expect it, given what the tone needed to be. I mean, I didn't ask a lot of Richard Dreyfuss in Close Encounters either. I just liked his descent into madness. Um, and I think that she... what I mean, she brought interesting stuff to her character for sure. I mean, apparently that hairstyle was her idea. She came in and she was like, I need the hair to be Karen Silkwood. Straight up, that's what we're going to do because I'm crusading. Um, mm-hmm. But I did think that it was she or or... The, or the Duffer brothers tended to substitute um, panic for, uh, or, or frenetic, I guess, for for a more nuanced read. That that being said, I I did like the way that the kind of force of nature that was her uh, her kind of tenacity brought other people into her orbit. Right? She basically uh, convinced slash coerced Hopper over the course of the series into buying in. And he got there and she brought him there, which was, uh, you know, she she definitely she emerges a very strong character. And she certainly was one of the stronger characters of the show. Well, just the scene where she puts up the Christmas lights and they spell out run. That was one of my favorite scenes in this show. Those don't actually spell out fuck Trump like they do <laughs> in the gift that I'm seeing everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, what do you guys think of some of these other characters we've mentioned, like Hopper or Jonathan? What are your how do you feel about them? I, I, want, I want Hopper to adopt Dustin because whoever his parents are are not doing a great job. And I think a Hopper <laughs> Dustin kind of 10 speed and brown shoe crime fighting procedural. <laughs> that's what I want from season two. Well, Dustin's the best kid. Incredible. 
Like, I just want to pinch his cheeks and just, like, adopt him myself. He's wonderful. <laughs> There's a great gif of him that where he's he's just smiling. He, like, he, you <laughs> see him just break into that huge smile. It, it makes it makes me smile when I see it. because he, he is a, a really cute kid. Um, the funny thing about the show is that his, apparently while they were filming it, his voice dropped, like, from the beginning of production to the end. So they couldn't use his voice for voiceovers anymore. Oh, no. So they're, they're, they're saying that that will, if they go into a second season, they're going to have to figure out how to sort of get around that. Because these kids are, are you know, at, at that age, they're growing up fast. So they're going to have to figure out how to, you know, do a story that makes sense where that all makes sense. Well, I saw that they were going to, if they do a second season, which I think is pretty much certain at this point, that they're going to, it would be set a year later. So the kids would be the actual age they're supposed to be. So it wouldn't be that much of a problem, I wouldn't think. Yeah. I think it's all hypothetical at this point because because Netflix actually has to go and, and give them a second season order. Um, and there's been a little bit of talk. They've given a couple of interviews about what they'd like to do, but I, I think that until until we actually like see it, we're not going to know. Right, but there was some watch. Netflix executive who has just been quoted as saying it would be stupid for them not to do a second season. So yeah, it seems pretty. I'm pretty I mean, confident. It's, the, that it's the talk of the internet that uh, the past couple of weeks. Well, right. I mean, because because we're saying that this show, in a lot of ways, just recapitulates. Uh, classic 80s movies but as you're saying I mean it's just like everyone's talking about it it's really blown up do you guys have any thoughts about why this has struck such a nerve with people I mean is it just nostalgia or is there something more to it I mean um, I know Peter what do you think about that uh, I think it's it's like a a middle brow version of true detective hysteria season one by which I mean uh, you know people were rightfully turned off by um or a lot of people were rightfully turned off by by uh, season one of True Detective, though the people that it got it completely consumed them, right? Because you had this world sketched out, and you had the hint of something lurking beneath the surface, and you had this hope that things would get wrapped up really nicely at the end, and and we would learn about this incredible conspiracy, and this throws away uh, the kind of turgid purple tonal stuff uh and self-importance of uh you know mcconaughey's dialogue in that and it gives us that same feeling of wonder in a completely recognizable reconstituted package so i think it brings people along both for this tone that if people don't if they didn't experience it firsthand they know it just through the way culture has filtered down these 80s tropes over the years. But then secondarily, there is this thing at play. There's this propulsive thing of, well, one more episode, maybe we're going to find out a little bit more. Maybe we're going to find out a little bit more. So um, I, I use middle brow as a, as a compliment. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like, I think that it is a, um, it's, it's just, it's a popcorn version of True Detective in the best way possible. Hmm. I mean, Carly, why do you think people love this show so much? I mean, I was going to say something similar in the sense that it is very accessible in that, like, it, you know, it, it's, it's familiar because of all the 80s stuff, but it's also a horror show, but it's not too scary, so people can enjoy it. It's got the supernatural element that, you know, is very fantastical and interesting, and it's it's paced in such a way that makes it very binge-watchable in that, like, they they reveal everything just when it's supposed to. Um, so you, you're like, oh man, I want to know what's happening. Who's this girl? First episode. Who's this girl? Okay. Next episode. You know, we find out sort of her deal, but over time we learn more about it. So it's kind of just like also very well paced and, you know, just the right length for people to watch. Cause it's only, you know, eight episodes long. So it's very easy to get through in about a weekend. Um, and like the Netflix model in general is very good for this kind of thing because you have like people getting through shows in maybe a couple of days and then being able to talk about online very quickly. Um, so I think that also has something to do with it. Um, and the nostalgia definitely helps, but I think there's other stuff coming into play here. Well, Carly, there was a line in your io9 piece that really struck me where you say Stranger Things isn't just a horror throwback, but a show that embodies the best parts of nerd culture. Could you talk about what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean... Like, I, I do hesitate a little bit to use the term nerd culture, but it was the only thing that kind of fit um, at the time. But it's something the lines of, like, it takes, you know, the best part of, you know, finding other people that are into the same things you are and, you know, 
ha- like going on these adventures with people that you know and are very comfortable around and you know also just kind of enjoying like sitting down and enjoying Star Wars you know so I think that like especially with these four boys you have like the bully storyline and the that, those kinds of things that would come along with like a 1980s story about nerds but it's something that kind of like brings them together this like shared interest in like dungeons and dragons and you know, radios and radios and lord of the rings and so i think that it's just something that kind of like is a force that kind of works underneath the entire series that brings people together over these crazy things that are happening so i think that's what i was kind of going for yeah i mean andrew do you have anything you want to add about why people are are really getting into the show um nostalgia is really big um especially for like the stuff that happened in the 1980s i mean just look at the big blockbusters you have on the in the theaters like star wars is back star trek is back we have aliens coming back ghostbusters is back you know the list goes on and on and on um and i think that there's I mean, obviously, all those properties are back and there's people who are willing to plunk down money to buy them and watch them. But I think there's also a, a, a real demand for stuff that's original, but not terribly different. So when you have a show that basically takes all of these um, various parts from all these 80s, from all these you know 80s properties and, and, and figures and you recombine them into something that's new, I think that's why it's been it's captured you know the on the emotional side but also just you know people can like look at the the shots and the characters and say oh i recognize that for that but it's different and they i can see that but it's different so it's 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 okay to it's okay to like it because it's not a rehash and a a recycled franchise essentially well okay so here's another thing from a review that really struck me this is from abraham reisman's review in vulture he says the crystal clear subtext of stranger things is an argument that there was something special about the horror and sci-fi filmmaking that emerged in the 1980s um, Andrew, I mean, do you think, do you see that, that there's some qualities that those 1980s movies had in horror and science fiction that have been lost and people are missing? I think so. Um, I think, I th- well, I, it was, the 80s were a time of, a, of real experimentation and a, like this, this real blossoming of science fiction cinema. I mean, you had Star Wars in the 1970s and, and Star Trek and, and some of the other, you know, films that had really gone, you know, that are classics now. But the 80s has so many films um i i think that it's it's a combination of you know people you know a lot of a lot of teenagers uh, you know being able to go to the movies and and combined with a lot of films that were coming out that could make use of special effects um you had a lot of really talented actors who were coming onto the scene at that point a lot of talented directors who were coming onto the scene at that point and they essentially just you know everything's just sort of converged at the right point so i think that you have i mean you've got the same decade that you've got Terminator, you've got Blade Runner, you've got Ghostbusters, E.T., you know, all these really great films um, just converging at this one point. And so I think that's sort of why uh, why we sort of look back to that point, just because there's so many things to pick and choose from. I'd also argue that there's this other thing at play about the sci-fi slash horror slash fantasy of the 80s, and that is that it didn't pander to kids, but it also had it it kind of drew some tonal lines. Like if you look at the the past twenty, you know, the thirty years since that happened, where horror has gone, where sci-fi has gone, uh what passed for controversy in a movie in the eighties or was, you know, the face melting at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's what gave kids kind of good natured nightmares, right? As opposed to the Saw movies. So we, you know, even the slasher movies of the 80s, which I would love to see the Duffer Brothers kind of go back to as, as an inspiration in a later season, is they were, it was tamer. So you had this vast kind of ecosystem of movies that were all ages. They let kids feel like adults and they let everyone get through kind of a mature storyline without being utterly traumatized. And that's a thing that has kind of disappeared. Like we've become so much starker in every way uh whether it's in subject matter or in vfx uh or or the way things are shot you know 
you look at what found footage did to horror movies or, or, or whatever it is, that it's going back to this time that was that seems innocent, but was also kind of remarkably inclusive for viewers. And I think people are really responding to that part of the of the artifact. I mean, Carly, do you have anything you want to say about 80s movies versus today? Yeah, um, I think it it's not necessarily exclusive to 80s movies, but I think something that we all kind of love about certain movies like Goonies and E.T. is that the children are the heroes. Um, and that, like, you have these, you know, adult figures that are either the antagonists, you know, in, like, you know, in Stranger Things, you have the, like, the secret government agency and things like that. And there are these, like, kids that are just being like, yeah, we're just going to figure it out on our own. And then they go do that. And, you know, when we were kids, that was so cool to watch because it made us feel like we could do anything and that we were empowered. And, you know, it like, you, we had, like, heroes to look up to. But then we also had people that seemed to be our own age that could do these amazing things. And I think there's some part of us, even as we're older, that still kind of latches on to that a bit. Um, so I think it kind of like that's something else that also spans, you know, generations and in age, uh, in age ranges. Cause you have like, you know, younger people can watch Stranger Things and connect with the ages of the characters. But then we can be like, oh, we were that age once. Hmm. What was what was our life like? And considering the kids in Stranger Things have all this like agency and motivation and they're kind of they're not really like treated like kids in a lot of ways like they are. But, you know, when they talk to the science teacher and they're like, how do you create a sensory deprivation tank? And the science teacher's like, <laughs> oh, I will tell you how exactly, <laughs> student of mine. And it's nice. It's very like there's something in us that kind of like recognizes what a big deal that is. Hmm. Well, you mentioned the se the secret government agency. I want to talk about that because uh, this is sort of where I felt the show started going off the rails a little bit for me. Is I just really had a hard time believing some of the stuff involving the secret government agency. Uh, the whole thing with the fake body for Will, like where did that come from? How did they make it? And then Hopper breaking into the lab. Just it just really started to break my suspension of disbelief at that point. I don't know if anyone felt that same way, but I don't know, Peter. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think they got the the fake will. I think that I saw that body pillow on Etsy, so I picked that out. But no, I mean I agree with you. I think that that one of the I don't want to say failings, but one of the flaws of the show is because it prized atmosphere so much that it didn't necessarily tie up every narrative bit. Um, and I think that uh, that once you were bought in, you were like, yeah, you know, panoptic, omnipotent government agency, of course they would have a, you know, a stuffed body double, of course this and that. Um, uh, and we'll just write it all off to MK Ultra because that was a real thing. And yeah, brain control, man. Uh, but I think that, um, I, I think that those were, road bumps for people they weren't spike strips you know what i'm saying like it was a thing that your brain worried over for maybe a, a minute and then you're like ah screw it <laughs> yeah and it's all kind of in service to the story so you're just kind of like you just kind of accept it because there's like basically in anything you watch there's things that don't really you know pay attention to logic but they kind of have to be there because you're like well this is only you know so long you got to move the story along somehow um so, so there are these, you know, there are the things like Hopper getting into the lab that I'm like, well, that made no sense because they said that there were tons of cameras everywhere and they should have found them. And, you know, who was funding this government agency and how did they like set up shop and nobody seemed to really mind um, in this town? I feel like a small town would probably be very suspicious of, you know, an organization like that just being there, um, especially if it was the 80s and... You know, you have all this, like, Cold War panic going around. So, like, that seemed also very strange. But it was also kind of just one of those things where you're like, well, it moves the plot forward. Um, and it's kind of funny in, like, a corny, campy kind of way. So you kind of just let it happen. Hmm. I mean, Andrew, what do you think about the sort of logical issues? So I, I did a little bit of looking into the Department of Energy. And um, I, I wrote a piece for The Verge on this. And what they... 
what they, the Department of Energy had was it, what its mandate is, is it's to basically secure the, nu- the nation's nuclear supplies and overseas nuclear weapons, nuclear power, um, the, um, all the missiles, things like that. Uh, the interesting thing that I learned is that they are also responsible for the Human Genome Project. And they do a lot of research. Uh, they, they are the largest researcher of um, like material science in the United States. So I, I didn't find I, I didn't find the fact that they, you know that the Department of Energy was funding this secret uh, program into like mind control because it it sort of fits with some of the stuff that they probably did do. No, in but that's that, I, that's not the thing I had plausibility issues with. It was the more like capturing Hopper and then drugging him and. Dumping him in his trailer. I mean, and stuff you're like you're also talking about a show that has interdimensional monsters. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's 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 those stretches are are you know doable. I, I think that the the stretch the stretch with like the Department of Energy is that you have like this top secret uh, facility and or or program in the middle of this small town, w- which is sort of what this what the Department of Energy did is they they did they funded research projects and and I mean it's a, it's a mil it's a quasi military governmental facility i mean it's probably i mean there there's towns that spring up a, around these sorts of facilities because they're a big employer and and they uh they bring in a lot of revenue for town so i don't think that that was as much of a a stretch for me i just sort of went with it interesting okay i'll say the other i, I pretty much went with the show except that the, that thing and then the other thing was where the bully is holding a switchblade at the kid's mouth and yeah. telling um um, Mike, right to to take what is obviously a fatal jump off of a cliff. Um, that that was another thing where I, I my my suspension of disbelief broke down at that point. That, yeah. And that Mike would do, would would actually take the fatal jump off the cliff as well. Right. Yeah. That was that was a weak moment for sure. Kids are jerks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I was gonna say I've I've known some pretty terrible children. Yeah, and I I can I've I'm pretty sure that there's stuff like that that's happened. I. I, I know I know when I was I I was more surprised about the knife than I was about him ordering him to take a jump. So I mean ki- kids will jump off of I I actually live near a, a bunch of granite quarries here in Vermont and there is a whole bunch of you know people who go up to the quarries and jump off of similar heights. Maybe not quite that high but you know very high, high uh uh jumps. Well I mean if the jump had been scary and dangerous but not obviously fatal which is how it looked to me in the show i would have been able to believe it but it just seemed it was it was like eight times as high as i thought it could should be for possibility well, issues you, you know where kids definitely do jump off quarries uh you know the limestone quarries in indiana for sure but they don't do it when they're 11 you know that's mm-hmm. a that is a high school and college kid uh activity yeah, for sure mm-hmm Oh, okay, well, well, wait. So, as, oh. Sorry, I just wanted to add, as somebody who was babysitting a kid in second grade who then pulled a knife on <laughs> me, I <laughs> don't think the the knife was that far of a stretch, but that's just me. <laughs> okay, wait, so we have an expert here. So so what is, so what? have you jumped off, Peter? Have you jumped off a height like that? I mean, it just seems oh, God, like no. I couldn't oh, God, see no. anyone <laughs> surviving that. Uh, but, you know, I will, if we need a cinematic precedent, I will refer people to the opening scene of Breaking Away. Uh, the 79 or 1980 movie set uh, in my hometown where college kids go and jump off a quarry. Though, where they filmed in Georgia, the quarries were a little bit higher than the limestone quarries of Indiana. So, uh, you know, while it happens, I don't know that they were that, that high. Hmm. All right. I mean, another thing I kind of want to say about this is that I, I have not, as I said, gone back and watched E.T., or Poltergeist or something like that since I was a kid. But I have this sneaking suspicion that if I were to go back and watch them now, they would not strike me as as well executed as this in terms of the acting and the cinematography and things like that. I mean, just the scenes in this where uh, where Elle is in the kind of like psychic world with the dark water under her feet where she's spying on people. And I mean, that just struck me as unbelievably visually gorgeous. And I don't remember seeing anything back in the 80s uh, of that sheer visual appeal. But that's just a reflection of technology, isn't it? I mean, we had Labyrinth, and it just couldn't do what we can do now. Uh, yeah. Y- you know, it's it's the, the democratization of high-octane visual effects and CGI. I think that things were shot as sophisticatedly, uh, you know, when Donner made Goonies or when Spielberg made E.T., those, uh, those created some of those tropes for a reason and, and shot things a creative way for a reason. 
Um, you know, when L or uh, when L comes out of the gets dressed up in the in the um, the wig and the dress and walks out in the hallway. If you go back and you look at the the ET scene that that's really inspired by, the way they shot that was kind of beautifully low to the ground so that you had that full effect of kind of being on ET's level and the way that. Spielberg created mystery and the way that Donner created that thrill of kids going off and having an adult adventure, I think, seeps through visually uh, in, in a lot of ways. It's not, you know, it's not Kurosawa, but it, it really did create a library of, um, of kind of cinematic moves that I think uh, have, have been trotted out time and time again. I just I went and saw after I finished um, Stranger Things, I went and, and, and started watching E.T., and I, I don't think I would agree that it, it doesn't I, that movie holds up really well, um, and the the acting in there and and the the direction I think it still it it still holds up really nicely today. Um, and so does Poltergeist, I think. Yeah, you know, to me, it's funny that I, Mike uh, Finn Wolfhard has gotten uh, you know a lot of praise, and and I think he does fine, but he is not a reason for me to to really enjoy Stranger Things. I thought that um, the girl who played Eleven and the kid who played Dustin, um, you know, outshone him. And, and some of that is the way they were, they, the way they were deployed. But I think that go back and look at, is that Henry Thomas in E.T.? Is that right? I should probably have looked that up first. Um, that sounds right. But like he or kind of Josh Brolin and Goonies or any of the kids in Goonies, I think were gifted uh, performers in a way that I would I would say that across the board the kid performances were stronger in eighties movies than they were than they were here. Hmm. Right, well, I'll, I'll have to go I'll have to go watch rewatch some of those movies and uh, and check that out. Yeah, um, there's a great um, clip online of that somebody had went and put, pasted together all of the all of the scenes that Stranger Things had borrowed um, from from all these eighties films. It goes from everything from Aliens to E. T. to Close Encounters, and it. it they they basically have the the two films or the two clips running next to one another so you can see visually how they they line up and it's it's really that's our, it, it serves as a really good list of what what to watch if you're still looking to sort of follow up on that uh, that feeling of the the nostalgia yeah no i saw that that was really striking um yeah. you know it's interesting too that i think that a lot of those original movies it kind of depends on how you go back to them because if you're seeing them for the first time now you know, I had heard growing up, I would heard so much about what a groundbreaking movie Easy Rider was. And by the time I finally saw Easy Rider, I was kind of like, OK, well, what's special about that? Just because so many movies that I'd seen in the intervening years had borrowed from it or been inspired Ooh. by it. And I think that and I I, I hate relying on you had to be there because I think it's it, it just doesn't hold water. But I think that to go back now and watch those movies for the first time could be disappointing yeah i had the same experience when i saw star wars for the first time because i saw it kind of late i saw it in high school so you know by then you had all these people being like star wars are the best and i had already we had already passed by the prequels you know at this point when i was in high school so i was like okay i'll go back and watch the originals and you know they were good i enjoyed them but they definitely didn't live up to the crazy hype that, you know, that had been embedded in my head. And you're also taking them out of that kind of collective experience as well. Yeah. You know, when they're ruling the zeitgeist the way that they were, it was like seeing Batman in 89. Uh, you know, you go back now and you watch the first Batman for the first time and it's robbed of the hysteria that was around that surrounded that movie when it was in production and when it came out is that that's an. I don't think that we can completely invalidate the the kind of enhancement that that brings to to a viewing experience. Okay, well, so Andrew, so I I mentioned I really liked the cinematography in this show, and I also loved the music. And I saw you wrote a piece on Verge about the soundtrack for this coming out. You want to talk a little bit about the music in this? Yeah. Um, so the soundtrack is was done by a band called Survive, and that's Survive with a uppercase and with a space between each letter. Of um, course, it's a <laughs> <laughs> it's a synth band out of uh, Austin, Texas, uh, and uh, I, I don't know when I when I started watching it, I was really struck by like the 
the, the first thing that really struck me was the was the opening credits. And yeah. It's just this really cool, just synthy uh, tune. It, it's it's not distinctive. It's not bombastic. It just it just fits the the tone of the show perfectly. And as I as I was watching it, I just kept noticing these, you know, how just understated it was. But I have a feeling that if you were to strip the soundtrack out completely, it would really um, you you would notice it, even though it's it's not really noticeable. Um, and uh, nev- apparently, a lot of other people really liked it, and they were they're tweeting or facebooking Netflix, and they they basically said, "Yep, we've got a we've got a sound a soundtrack coming soon, but um, there's no date for that." So hopefully, at some point. Um, they'll release that. Um, I do know that the band is releasing a new album later this year. It's called R R R seven three four nine, and that's coming out at the end of September. And, and they've got a couple of tracks on on Bandcamp that are are quite good. You can listen to a couple of them. Does Does that name have any significance? I, I honestly I don't know. I it it just seems to fit with the type of band they are. Um, they, they're they have another couple of albums that are all sort of titled in similar ways. Um, so, uh, maybe, maybe that they've got their own little internal thing that they're, that they're doing. Um, they're, another album that they have is called MF064, uh, MNQ026, uh, HD009. Um, so they've got, it looks like they've been sort of doing that for a little while. They just name all their albums by just randomly mashing keys on the keyboard. Or something, or maybe they get their cat to, to <laughs> But I, I, they, they're the band, The song that they have online is called A A H B, um, and it's it's really worth listening to. I I really liked it. It's it, I know a lot of writers listen to the show, and if if you're looking for a really good um, soundtrack to listen to, this this seems like it's it's a good one. It, it's it reminded me a little bit of um, um, the um, a, a social network soundtrack. Um, oh, the trend if, if by. Uh, yeah, by Trent Reznor, and and um, it, it's it's just sort of one of those things that just sits in the background. And it just it sounds cool. I don't know how I'm not a sound person, so I don't know how they did this. But man, whenever the characters were going through that portal in the basement of the lab, my it just made my skin crawl or like my, my hair stand up on end. There was just something about the the way the sound design was. It was just so otherworldly and unsettling. I can't recall kind of what was this was this musical or was this sound effects stuff i think it was just it was sound some sort of sound some sort of like humming or something like that you know that was it's such a it's such a necessary element of of horror movies and you go back and you look at what things like the shining or exorcist did with sound at a level that's almost not perceptible but it really increases your anxiety about things that like droning and hum is a uh, it's a remarkably effective device to use, and they did they they wielded it well. I actually saw the the director say that they weren't sure initially if they were even going to be able to include the upside down world due to budget constraints, and uh, I thought given that the budget was apparently that constrained, I thought they did a remarkable job with the upside down. I, I really found it very uh, very striking. I mean, it is very simple. In a way, it's just, you know, the normal world, but covered in this, like, weird dust and these, like, web-looking things. So it's, it's like, a very, like, ingenious, very simple design that, like, really is striking because it is so weird. And it's so, like, just completely opposite of what we, you know, understand. And I think the whole scene with Barb early on that, you know, we all despise because Barb is great. <laughs> Um, where you see the, the, the upside down for the first time, or you get a clear view of the upside down, it just kind of sets the tone for the rest of the entire series. When you see that, it just kind of like sends a chill up your spine because you know what it means. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing too, is they could evoke the upside down by basically giving you a black box theater. Like when, when they went in and they found, uh, I keep calling it the Demogorgon, the Upside Down Monster. Um, you know, it's basically like an empty stage. Uh, so they had kind of two modes of representing the Upside Down. Or maybe it was like the Upside Down in this kind of limbo where uh, where, where he would be. Um, and, and I wonder if that was intentional because you saw where the bodies were stashed. But then when you saw it feeding, it was feeding in a place that was utterly without detail. Yeah. 
And I think also um, it does employ some little camera tricks to, I, I, I assume for budget constraints, like you barely see the monster until like the end. You see him kind of like in the corner of your eye and he's on screen for like maybe a second. Um, so that's, that's also probably like, like it, it worked in Jaws. It works here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other than the last episode, you're right. I mean, it was just snippets. And so you had the kind of, disintegration of the monster and you had the moment with will at the very end and beyond that um yeah there wasn't a lot of kind of expensive seeming sequences well i guess speaking of the disintegration of the monster you know that brings us to l's death um i mean genevieve in her article was was pretty or, oh no it's it's uh, lenica cruz in the atlantic uh, maybe both of them were, were pretty critical of that i mean how did you guys feel like andrew how did you feel about l Dying at the end? Oh, I don't think she's dead. I think she's coming back. Uh, Agreed. Well, yeah. Who, yeah. who are those egos for, man? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I absolutely don't think that she's dead. I, I think that there, she will be back at, in some form, somehow. Whenever they, go, whenever they come back with another season. So, um, I, I do think that her, you know, the, the, her sacrificing herself for the group was fine. Um, I mean, it's. It's a kids thing, and I think I think you can certainly argue any number of ways with you know well, the gender politics of it. I I think that it it's it sort of worked. I, um, it it was definitely something I saw from a mile away, and I th I don't think I think that's one of the other problems with nostalgia is that it was there were a lot of these parts that were sort of telegraphed ahead of time, and they, they were pretty predictable when they that they would happen. So um, I I I thought it was a fine a fine way to end off in the season. I just thought it was it was fairly predictable. Agreed. When once they started talking about like the winter ball or whatever, it's like, oh, she's gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that there's something, you know, the the one place where there's mystery to me is what Hopper's relationship now is with Doctor uh, with Doctor Brenner with Matt Matthew Nadine's character. Like they struck an arrangement so that he could go in to the Upside Down. But then when they came out, he got in the car. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the threads they're going to have to pick up, but it's one that is, I, I think will kind of shed some light back on season one. Yeah, agreed. I, I thought the mysteries and the resolution was, was oddly structured in this to the extent that you could almost take away the last couple scenes and everything would have been tied up perfectly neatly, right? Absolutely. Um, it's almost like, you know, the, it's almost like they didn't know whether they were going to get a season two or not. And then, you know, they're like, okay, we're getting a season two. Let's shoot a couple of scenes to, to create some new mysteries. I didn't feel like they flowed particularly organically. You know, I, it seems like if they, yeah. um, you know, I, I think if, if some of the mysteries had, some of those mysteries that came up at the end had been introduced a little earlier, I think it might've not felt so like we're wrapping this up. Oh wait, no, we're not right at the end. Yeah. I think that they 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 also uh, finished production like a week before it went up online. Oh wow! So it was it was a very I, I I think that that they put in those elements just to make sure that you know they would um you know that they have these hooks for another season, and so I I I think that that would be a, a almost an essential thing you do now with a television show, even if it even if you intend it to be just a season, you still leave you still leave a little bit in case it, it blows up and if it didn't blow up and it didn't, it, it was just sort of a sleeper hit. They could just say, well, this is, you know, we could just tie it off pretty neatly. Um, I, th yeah, I think no. it does show that they had some confidence in it. Sorry, Carly. I didn't mean to. No, I was just, I was just going to agree and say like, I did find like the ending was this like nice balance between we could have ended it here, but we also left room for a, a second season if we really wanted to. Yeah. One thing I, I was sort of wondering about, um, it is, it's sort of related is, is they, Netflix is great at just dumping all the episodes online and letting people sort of find it and have the word of mouth stuff, um, you know, filter through. I, I was wondering what, what would the reaction have been if they had released this week to week and you'd sort of have this, this story that's unfolding and the, the word of mouth is unfolding at the same time. You know, like when Lost came out, everybody was sort of going crazy for, you know, like, oh my God, what are the, um, you know, you know, what, what, what is this thing? And everybody was talking about it at the same time and everybody, you know, went to ABC on that, whatever night it was showing and they'd watch and then they'd go back and discuss it. And you don't really have that now with binge television. You, you have the, the 
the five people in the room who watch all of it all at once. Then you have the next 10 people who sort of get to it whenever they can, but within the first week. And then you have the, the much larger group that watches it over a little bit longer time. And then you have the latecomers who hear the, the word of mouth and then jump in and watch. And, you know, the whole thing cycle starts over again. But I, I just sort of wonder what the critical response would have been if, if they had played it out over the over eight weeks from the middle of July so that it would still be ongoing right now. Um, I, th- I think that would be kind of interesting to see how that happened. I think the stumbles would be much more prominent in in the discussion of the show because, yeah. you know, we everyone mainlined this thing, right? You You get – if we have a week to breathe between episodes with any show, there's that much more time to suss out slow periods and flaws and loopholes and uh you know it's i think it's just kind of the nature of the beast and one of the smartest things about the all at once model is you leave and your lasting impression is of the show's character not of the show's details i'm just curious have you had had any of you guys heard anything about this show before it came out i mean i I just didn't even hear hear about it until this listener recommended we check it out was there any pre-release hype at all for this show i saw a little marketing for it um i think i maybe saw it on netflix i remember seeing i remember seeing a trailer for it but i can't remember where i saw it um and i know like you know some of the websites i follow were talking about it um like io9 was doing some reporting on it before it came out so that's kind of how I heard about it, but it was it did slip under the radar. Yeah, I I, I found out about it through Facebook. Uh, people were talking about it, and e- even then, even the first couple of people were talking about it, I didn't really pay attention. And, and then you sort of got this critical mass. Yeah, I mean the 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 way the Netflix publicity machine works is uh, kind of inconsistent, and and for whatever reason, uh, it wasn't. You know, I got. Let's see. I'm actually going back now, so I can I can tell you when I started even seeing things, and that is, gosh, no, it's not until they sent out the nap. Like, here's what's coming to Netflix in July on June 21st <laughs> that I had my first inkling. <laughs> and to be honest, uh, it kind of if you hadn't heard anything about it or you weren't talking to people who were excited for it, it was like. Oh, what's this YA show that has um, that has one on a writer in it? It wasn't until I hate to admit it, it wasn't until the Monday after it premiered. I mean, I noticed it on Netflix when I was using Netflix, but I wasn't like, oh, what is this? And it wasn't until word of mouth started to spread. And that's the magical thing about this show is it's not like, oh my God, David Fincher and Kevin Spacey are are making a show for Netflix. We've had so many marquee shows come to Netflix now. That this just kind of was the sleeper. This was this kind of slipped through the cracks for everyone. Uh, I also just want to mention. So, in one of the last shots of the show, we see that Nancy has gotten together with uh, douchey Steve rather than <laughs> creepy Jonathan. He's not that douchey. Uh, well, he just he just looks douchey. He just has a terrible slender. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how'd you guys? So, so Carly, how'd you 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 did you you endorse Nancy's choice of uh, Steve over Jonathan? I mean. I mean, she's in high school. She's not going to end up with either one of them, regardless, because it's high school. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that she ended up with Steve because Steve did, like, he did tr- actually care for her. And over the course of the show, you see him actually trying to prove himself to her to be a decent guy. While you know, jo- her and Jonathan, the only thing they really had in common was that they had two people in their lives that went missing to this thing. And, you know, they talked a little bit about, like, teenager things, like, oh, no one understands me, you know, those kinds of things. But they didn't really, we didn't really see their relationship outside of that. So I think that, like, people wanted them to get together because Jonathan wasn't the, like, the popular kid. And we don't, we don't, we generally prefer it when the underdog gets a shot. Um, I think, I think the relationship's probably just going to be expanded a bit more if they do a second season because they definitely that's not definitely a thread that they leave open but i don't mind it that she ended up with steve because steve did eventually kind of prove himself to be a decent human being at the end and you know that endeared him to me besides the fact that he had amazing hair <laughs> um, well, well you said in your article i think right that you never got past jonathan taking pictures of her undressing right yeah i, I know like that wasn't his intention, but it's still very creepy. And I would, 
I would never like personally interact with somebody who ever did that to me. I mean, some other people are more forgiving, but for me, that's just like a huge no. I mean, what do what do your other guys think about Steve versus? So, so well, so so they did something interesting with Jonathan, creepy voyeurism notwithstanding, uh, and that is the the eighties trope of the shy kid or the loner that turns out to have a rich inner life we knew that we knew this kid's inner life before the other characters did so kind of we had invested in him as a good kid before the photography and after the photography which was a kind of complete reversal of that trope um but that being said only one of those two had the presence of mind to actually twirl the spiked bat and give it a spin before they hit the monster (laughs) during that fight i was like where did this dude get the presence of mind to pull some acrobatics with a spiked bat while he was trying to deliver a death blow? It it kind of the way that they would sprinkle in those little like alpha jock villain flourishes, like he was so much like at the beginning he was kind of Billy from Karate Kid, and I hate to keep speaking in comparisons. And then he had his redemptive moments, but they were always leavened with that. Don't forget, he's also a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Speaking of uh, romances that were a little bit dubious on, does anyone else share my slight discomfort with Mike putting the moves on a girl who didn't understand the concept of friendship until like three days before that? Oh, hell yes. Yeah, of course. There's the the sweetness. (laughs) Yeah, there's the sweetness of like childhood crushes, but didn't need it. On the the other hand, you know, they're they're 11 year old boys that (laughs) also clearly do not understand romance beside beyond you know, the very broadest sketches. So. And I don't even think they really, like, understood Eleven's situation fully either. Yeah. So, like, they're like, oh, she's weird. And over time they learn a bit more, but even still, they're still like, why is she acting this way? We don't, I don't understand why you would, you know, betray us, quote unquote, like this kind of thing. So and I she think, had superpowers. And she had superpowers, which is also just very confusing to an 11 year old. <laughs> Um, okay, so Peter, so in your article, um, Brian Raftery says, uh, trying to replicate the cozy vibes of Stranger Things' his first season seems like a tough task, especially since the show has already exhausted pretty much every early eighty early eighties movie already. And I was just wondering, what do you think about the? What do you think about that? Do you think it's going to be tough to do a second season of the show? So, uh, you know, I think that as he and I discussed it, he was very much of the mind that it should be a one and done. Uh, and I liked the feel of the show so much I didn't want it, be, it to be over, but I also didn't want them to descend into that narrative uncertainty that the writers of Lost did. So I think we came to the agreement that I'd like to see this as an anthology model, which I, I realize is getting a little bit played out on television, but I think that there is such a great world here that I would like to see them uh, I'd like to see Stranger Things come back, but I don't think that that Stranger Thing necessarily needs to be the pedal head monster or the upside down. I think it could be a similarly atmospheric exploration of any of the other things that informed uh, that age, whether it was, uh, you know, I'll go back to the Satanic Panic again, or UFO conspiracies, or kidnappings, or what have you, or, or slasher movies. There were so many kind of cinematic and uh and sociological influences that i think it could very well be kind of that american crime story novel where each season you get this kind of fast propulsive satisfying eight episode joy ride through one of those facets of the 80s yeah i agree with i mean i i, I think it's going to be hard to do a second season of this because that t- like again they didn't introduce to my mind enough stuff that wasn't already resolved to yeah. to really propel the second season. And I mean, they said, I think that they're essentially, they're planning to bring the same characters back. That's what the buzz seems to indicate. So that it sort of cuts against doing an anthology. But um, yeah, I, I really liked this at eight episodes and I'm, I'm kind of apprehensive about, because it seems like they either have to introduce completely different things, which risks ruining what we liked about this, or give us more of the same, which I don't think I would right. be satisfied with. I, I think the danger is overextending an idea. I although it does can... give them, yeah, I was going to say, like, although they do have the opportunity to build on things and also, like, tweak things that people might have had a problem with in the first season. Yeah. Like, maybe they'll tone down the references. <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that would be a good move for them just because the the whole first season was built on nostalgia. And coming back without it would probably uh, kill it a bit, honestly. Um, but what, and what I was sort of thinking what they, would, what they could do is they could explore a little bit more of, you know, what is up the upside down world? Because it, it, what I was, what I was sort of wondering is, you know, you have this world that looks almost identical to our own, but it's, it's, the atmosphere is tanked. There's weird stuff growing all over it. So like maybe, maybe that there's, maybe the pedal monster is just the tip of the iceberg and that there's more lingering there. And that's, what's going to kind of come out in the next season. That That's sort of the direction I hope they go. They they can, they can build on it a little bit more. They can distance themselves a little bit. So it's not the same rehash, but, um, make it a little bit bigger and a little bit um, uh, more compelling moving forward. Yeah. Plus, like there was the egg. Yep. Yeah. There's the egg, and then the, obviously there's the the thing that was stuck down his throat, which is a total uh, alien reference. And mm-hmm. the, my one concern is though is that th- this show has been like you know fa- fairly universally praised. It's, it seems like the, the the buzz is that it's it's more people like it than dislike it. Um, the same was true with True Detective, and everybody was raving about it, and they like they couldn't wait to get the next season, and you know the the hype got so much that you no second season could come up, you know could meet match it, and when the second season came out, it dropped and it, it just died, it, like nobody liked it, and so I'm a little bit afraid that they'll get too wrapped up in the success of what was what made the the first season great, and then they'll just you know. Uh, call it it phone it in and just not it won't it won't leave up to the you know to its potential yeah yeah okay so carly so i was looking at your twitter today and it looks like you had gotten some interesting responses to your ir9 piece could you talk about that um i mean some pe- people are just picky um they'll be like well some people will be like you don't know what nerd culture means let me mansplain it to you actual tweet um and you know, people who just like didn't like attach themselves to stranger things in the same way and i tried to make it clear in my piece that this is just my personal this is based on my personal experience and how watching the show kind of brought up brought back certain memories of you know being a weird kid in middle and high school so i don't like people's opinions don't really bug me in this scenario because i was like this is my experience with the show this was my nostalgia this is you know when i looked at the, how the show portrayed D, how did i feel um so you know and besides it's the internet everyone's gonna have a negative opinion about something so yeah because you say nerd culture is wonderful but it's also terrible yeah that's just kind of something that it's always kind of there where you're like, nerd culture is great because it allows me to connect with people over these things. But then people come in and just kind of ruin it a lot. And that those are things that are pretty widely talked about online. It's not just something that I have an opinion on. That's just my opinion. Um, you know, you get people who come in and be like, well, your experience is wrong because, you know, X, Y, and Z. And like, it's stupid, but that's just stuff that like, if I'm going to write on the internet, I got to learn to ignore it or, you know, just take it in stride and just kind of deal with it. Because there are people that are going to be like, oh, I completely agree with you or I disagree with you, but I'm going to have a civil conversation about it. If only those were in the majority on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen any like responses like, oh, this song didn't come out until December of 1983 or things like that, where people are really... I saw uh, one. picking the we did a uh, we did our gear team did a breakdown of some of the gadgets and they found a couple of discrepancies, but they were doing it with their, you know, their tongue firmly planted <laughs> in their cheek. I did see one. I can't remember where I saw this. I'm going to guess Reddit, but it was uh, it was a kind of an angry deconstruction of all the flaws in the opening D&D scene. And I was like, come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Dude, I'm just curious. Do you remember what any of the flaws like? It, like, what was the most? It was based ridiculous? on. It was based on. Uh, I did he have to make a dexterity check? I can't remember what it was, but it was basically like you only had to one look, 
like it was it took one d10 for this it was like you could hear the guy's glasses being pushed up his <laughs> nose it was uh and i don't remember ad and d rules uh nearly enough to be able to kind of reconstruct what this person's issue was uh but rest assured it was minor and pedantic <laughs> yeah it was like i got a comment on my article that was basically like Ugh, why are you calling D D a board game exactly exactly it's like because sometimes it has a board <laughs> like don't no need to be so picky about it it's a it's fiction <laughs> this is my childhood they all screamed <laughs> Uh, IMDb has a has a small list of goofs, and it, it's usually like you know the, this gun wasn't introduced until the 1990s, or this car wasn't introduced. I think there, there's one I'm, I'm looking at it now. The Demogorgon miniature featured in the series, a miniature in the Fantasy Lord series produced by Grenadier Miniatures, wasn't released until mid 1984, uh, almost a year see after. See that ruins the set. whole show for me. Completely ruined. D and D is ruined. My childhood is ruined. <laughs> Just everything's terrible. This is why this is why Trump's still around. It's stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> so there is one cast member that that we and one performance that we haven't talked about at all. And I want to take a very quick second to shout out Joe Crest, who played the perennially clueless dad of the Wheeler family, who was such <laughs> a hilarious play to the uh, like the the absent parent who knows nothing about what their kids are up to and gets everything wrong it was it was a perfectly underplayed goofy bumbling performance and i loved it agreed it was like every time he was in a scene even if he was just doing little gestures it was something we would laugh at because it was it was such as like a parody of like 80s business dads yes and he, he kind of reminded me of my dad in a way just like you know comes home from work sleeps Watch TV, sleep some more. You also distilled but... <laughs> it so much better than I could have. It's eighties business dad. Like that is it. Thank you. <laughs> That's that is his name. I also just want to mention for all the Barb fans out there, the actress uh, Shannon Purser said today that she is interested in playing Squirrel Girl. So uh, you know, maybe we can make that happen. I mean, she looks like her. Yeah, and I read it. I read um an article. I forgot where it was. It might have been Hello Giggles, but I could be wrong where they were talking with the Duffer brothers about Barb as a character, and they were like, oh, you know, we kind of had to kill her for the plot, which is sad, but then they were like, oh, no, we really hated doing it because the actress was so great, and we really did enjoy the character. So I'm not sure if it was, like, the writing of Barb that really worked or if it was the performance of the actress, but either way, she's getting she's getting work. Straight up, it was the wardrobe, because the first time you saw her, you were like, jeans, check, glasses, check, shoes, <laughs> check. Uh, I mean, that I, I, at least on first introduction, I thought there was not a more pitch perfect evocation of that time than her. And she, re you know, she, she reinforced it with kind of a great comic performance, but the way that that character was first presented to us nailed it. Mm hmm. Okay, so, and then Andrew, I saw you had a piece that just came out say, that, that's called Finished Binging Netflix's Stranger Things. Pick up these 12 books next. So, I don't know, Jeff, maybe like two or three books that from that list people should check out? Yeah, so I, I like doing book lists for these sorts of things. And, and what I really liked about Stranger Things is like the, this idea of like small town horror and this, this sort of creepy atmosphere. And I, and I was, while I was watching it, there's like these books were coming to mind, like, hey, this would be, you know, maybe I should read this or pick this one up. Um, so I, I talked with some of the people uh, on our, our team about what their suggestions would be. And we, we came up with a short list. Um, uh, Oceans at the, Neil Gaiman's Ocean at the End of the Lane was one that came to mind really pretty immediately just because it's about a, it's about a boy in a young town. It's not set in America, but it's, it's set in a, uh, you know, it's a very nostalgic story about a young boy in a small town in the 1970s and these things coming in from another world. Um, there is also uh, a wrinkle in time deals with alternate worlds and, and sort of traveling to get a family member that's been kidnapped back. Um, and uh, what else do we have on there? Uh, oh, disappearance at devil's rock by Paul Tremblay. Um, that one is actually is about a, a group of friends who uh, a, a, one of their friends uh, disappears mysteriously. And you're never quite sure if there's a supernatural element to the, his disappearance or if it's just a, you know, a run of the mill disappearance. Um, but that, that movie, or sorry, that book came right to mind, um, 
when I was when I was watching it, and uh, uh, I highly recommend reading it too. Um, and then the last one on the list is also uh, Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, which uh, it, it's a a very very creepy book about uh, this alternate world or this thing that's coming into our own world that's sort of cut off the rest of uh, the southern coast and there's strange sciencey things and think stuff that happens. So they all they all sort of fit in some way or another. Yeah, yeah. So people definitely check those out. And while you're waiting for season two, there's 12 books on the list, so you have time to read them all. Can yeah. I, and there, sorry, I was just going to say, can I? I don't know. I don't know if this is on your list, so you can edit it out if it is. But I, I one book that came to mind for me was was it the last horror novel at the end of the world or something like that? It's by Brian Allen Carr. Um, and it's this novella that's basically about a small Texas town that's being overrun by like apocalyptic monsters. And it's got this really similar, like creepy small town feel to it, um, with some very interesting characters and it's very short. Um, so that's also something I would recommend. Um, all right, cool. So we're pretty much out of time. So let's just go around and have some final thoughts. Anything else you want to mention or add? So how about, uh, Andrew, any final thoughts on Stranger Things? I really liked it. I mean, it, it, it's, I know we were sort of picking it apart and saying that there's, you know, these problems with it, but despite all those issues, I, I was hooked from beginning to end. Like I, I was watching it. I, I was trying to actually space myself out. I didn't, I didn't watch more than an episode or two at a time. Um, and I, because it was a show I had to sit down and actually watch and, and pay attention to rather than like law and order, which I can throw on in the background and just have it run. <laughs> um, I, I, I was just, absolutely captured in a way that I, I really haven't been captured by a show in a little while. It, it's just a lot of, uh, the, the acting was great. The, the whole look and feel of it was great. I liked the story. Um, I liked the, the nostalgia part. Um, I, I really liked lots of it. And, um, I, I really hope that season two, uh, will live up to the first season. All right, cool. And Carly. Yeah. Um, similar, um, in that, I definitely admit that Stranger Things has its flaws. It's not perfect, but nothing really is. But I think, I think it's definitely a show worth checking out for. Uh, and it's funny, we were talking about this earlier, but it's basically, you, like, no matter what you're into, you could probably find something in Stranger Things you'll enjoy. Um, so I think it's definitely worth, uh, a look, especially because it's so short. All right, cool. And Peter, final, final thoughts? Yeah, I also really enjoyed it. I just, Duffer Brothers, if you're listening to this, you have the power. Make it an anthology. You don't need to go <laughs> back to Hawkins. <laughs> All right. So I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with Andrew Liptak, Carly Fulgucci, and Peter Rubin. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Andrew Liptak, Carly Fulgucci, and Peter Rubin for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Gara Cache and Jan Yantunin who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.